So, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to pay, um, make acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of the land and give respect to elders past, present and emerging and all indigenous people. Uh, always was and always will be. And I am speaking to you from uh, the Ewan land, which is on the southeast coast of New South Wales. Welcome everybody. And welcome to our international guests that are here and speakers. And tonight we're going to be, uh, we have a, a really interesting mixed bag of things to show you tonight. A whole range of different kinds of citizen science from around the world. So you're very welcome here. And um, uh, my name is Libby Hepburn. And I'm lucky enough to work um, globally with citizen science and with some global working groups. So I've actually come across and um, been fortunate enough to meet and to, to get to know some scientists from across the world. And the first person I'd like to introduce to you is a young scientist, Pen Yuang Singh. And at the moment he's living in, in Bath. Um, but he's worked uh, in a number of different countries um, and he has great insights into uh, co-created citizen science and believes that, that, that this gives tangible improvements for communities in the realm of environmental monitoring, public health and public policy. Um, Penn co-founded uh, Mammal Web, which I think he's going to talk about. And um, that's now in five European countries. And he, I got to know him because he advocates for open science with a citizen science global partnership. And he's created an online course and guidebook and run interactive workshops and received certification on open licensing, which he, he will hopefully explain to us. So, um, Penn, if I can ask you to take the screen and uh, yes, take over, that would be good. All right. Thank you so much, Libby, for your introduction. I am really lucky to be with you today, and I'm very grateful. Um, so I would like to use this time to talk a bit about my reflections on the relationship between civic engagement and citizen science. I'd like to start with the citizen science project I co-founded um, about six years ago now, uh, during my PhD in the UK. And it's for wildlife monitoring. And I'm very grateful and gratified that since we started in 2015, we now have more than 200 citizen scientists doing wildlife monitoring, um, where we've just expanded into five different countries um, across Europe. Uh, it's been a really cool process. And the tool that we use for this is the camera trap. Uh, so it takes motion sensing pictures of wildlife as they pass within the field of view of the camera trap. And I have to admit, when I started MammoWeb, I was very, very naive. I knew very little and I just thought, okay, so maybe I can use these wildlife photos to entice people, get them excited, go into the outdoors, set up camera traps for me and collect lots of data for me while I just sit behind my computer, right? And that did work out really well, this contributory model of citizen science and I am grateful, but what I always say is particularly interesting about Mammal Web is that a lot of our participants came with scientific questions of their own, and they started their own separate citizen science projects. For example, Roland, he got together with some of his friends uh, to start a red squirrel monitoring project in Scotland to look at how, how their populations have been affected by invasive gray squirrels. Um, another thing he did was that he started a camera trap survey near his home, um, near his village, and he discovered a previously unknown population of roe deer. And his data 
fed directly into the planning of a local nature reserve. And this really got me um, thinking about how citizen science, maybe it has the potential to be more than just collecting scientific data, as important as it is, uh, because citizen science can maybe also be a form of civic engagement. And to give you a more recent example of this, I'd like to talk a little bit about my home country of Taiwan, which is you know, this tiny island nation on the Western Pacific that has a population comparable to Australia. And what happened last year was that, you know, like most other countries, Taiwan was faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. And since Taiwan has past experience with a lot of acute respiratory illnesses, from the very beginning, there was very widespread adoption of wearing face masks, and everyone started doing it automatically. The problem was actually that um, there was a lot of panic buying of face masks at the beginning of last year, and a lot of stores ran out of them. So on social media, you could see a lot of people frantically asking other people about, you know, where can I still go to buy a face mask? I really need one. And it's important to remember that, you know, wearing a face mask is not just about protecting yourself from getting sick, it is also to slow the spread of a disease and, you know, prevent other people from getting sick as well. Um, so it's important to do, but because of this problem, you know, people were really worried. Now there was a citizen science network called GovZero. Uh, they've been running for many years now. They asked, you know, is there something we can do to help with this problem? Um, so that this coordination isn't happening in an ad hoc way on social media. So they developed a citizen science mapping platform uh, for buying face masks. And anyone can report on which stores still had masks. And this became so wildly successful that it got millions of users practically overnight. Um, in fact, the organizers had problem, you know, keeping up and doing all the hosting uh, online and all that stuff. So GovZero, they reached out to Taiwan's digital minister, and she actually incorporated this citizen science mapping platform into a national face mask rationing system. And this system distributed face masks exclusively through pharmacies because Taiwan's single-payer universal health care actually keeps track of um, the stock levels in each pharmacy. And what this meant was that when, um, whenever someone swipes their national insurance card to buy a face mask, that number would be automatically deducted from the database. So when you visit the map, it gives you a near real-time uh, view of where you should go to buy your face masks. And this meant that, you know, from the beginning when people were panic buying face masks, after a while, Taiwan was eventually able to provide a stable ration supply of face masks. So everyone can get the face masks that they need. In fact, later during the year, there was such a big surplus of face masks that Taiwan was able to donate more than 30 million of them globally to other places as humanitarian aid. Uh, to places like the US or the EU. Now, a big challenge was that Taiwan didn't have um, access to any COVID vaccine last year. Uh, so they had to take a lot of very aggressive containment measures, such as the uh, face mask rationing system. Uh, but even with all of these challenges, I'm really gratified and relieved to report that Taiwan was able to go for 248 days with zero local cases of COVID-19 last year. And the story I take from this is that, you know, citizen science can be part of a participatory democracy that directly influences public policy. And I think there's a lot of potential there. One of the examples I'll always like to talk about from earlier on in history is the SafeCast project. They started after the Fukushima nuclear disaster uh, a decade ago, where they developed and built their own open source hardware radiation sensors uh, that they used to map the distribution of harmful radiation in their communities. 
this has become a really successful global network. Another one I always talk about is Public Lab, uh, which started also just over a decade ago after the, the Product Horizon oil spill. And they you know, sent out their own aerial sensing platforms to map the spread of the oil spill. And now Public Lab is a huge international network of different citizen science projects. Uh, the one I really love is where they got photographic evidence that was used in a lawsuit against a private company that was dumping illegal substances into the Mississippi River. And this was all done from a grassroots citizen science project that you know, took on a more co-created model that was incredibly successful. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'll just say something that some people have heard me say multiple times, which is um, my realization that citizen science um, is, but it's not just about how um, uh, it's people collecting data passively for professional scientists, because it is very much also about how science can be a form of citizenship. And as people take part in citizen science in this way, they can really say that, hey, I'm actually doing something and take this form of civic empowerment um, to the wider democratic process, right? Because whether, you know, it's someone uh, mapping radiation, helping each other find face masks, or, you know, monitoring wildlife, it's all different ways of um, um, uh, uh, being enfranchised in the democratic process. And I think that is so important, especially now. So this is the inspiration that I take to any future citizen science projects that I'm involved in. Uh, so that's it from me. I'll just say a very quick summary. I hope it has been interesting to you. And thank you so much again for having me today. I look forward to any questions or critique that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penn. Um, as always, um, wonderful to hear from you and one, the wonderful examples that you've chosen. Um, now we'll, we'll have to move on quite quickly because we've got quite a, a, a lot to do here. So, uh, can, thank you very much. I'll just share my screen because I've got my, I've got all the other slide decks here. So if you'll bear with me. Okay. So next up, um, We've got, we're going to have a look at, oops, we're sorry, I need to. Into a network with more than 200 citizen science. Yeah, sorry, we've got to get through this one. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, it looks like that was mine. <laughs> let me just do that. Let me just move past that one. See where we are. Okay. Let's try this. Uh, this is Dr. Stephen Lo Loisel, and he's um, re Senior Research Manager at Earthwatch Europe um, and an Associate Professor at the University of Siena. Um, he's a colleague of, of Izzy Bishop, who we were listening to earlier on this afternoon at the, when we were talking about water monitoring. And the, the project that I've asked them to talk to us about is uh, the Global Fresh Water Watch uh, project that they've been running. And um, Stephen's led international research projects on Mediterranean coastal lakes um, and in the Yangtze. Um, and he's monitoring, uh, he's working with 40 agencies and research institutes to support monitoring and management of 2,000 water bodies on six continents. So this is kind of a large scale thing that we're talking about. And uh, I'll just run Stephen's uh, presentation for you. Good morning, this is Stephen Lassell. Um, I hope uh, the conference is going well. I'm going to make a presentation on Freshwater Watch, show you a little bit about some of the global aspects of this uh, freshwater citizen science project. So um, Freshwater Watch started in 2013 
essentially in the beginning it was focused on 20 cities across the globe north south america um, europe and asia and also sydney uh, we uh, developed a methodology that would be appropriate and useful uh, for all these cities so with detection limits and quality control and training that would work across the globe it's at the moment it's in uh, 12 different languages so it's 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 focused on providing um, citizen scientists with the opportunity to use a, a tried and tested method to help them understand more about their freshwater environments. I'm going to start uh, by presenting uh, several uh, several pro projects, both small and large. And I thought I'd start with this one, which is very close to the offices of Earthwatch in Oxford. Um, it's um, it started with a, a very passionate. Uh, let me take my picture off of this so you don't you can actually see something. A very passionate fisherman named John Pratt, um, who started noticing that things were changing in the the streams along the even load that he fished out of. Uh, working with the freshwater watch approach, he uh, started monitoring these and started noticing along the the catchment the places that had uh, elevated or relatively elevated. Uh, concentrations of phosphate were those downstream of certain wastewater treatment plants, small wastewater treatment plants, but downstream. And so through the through uh, gathering more data and working with uh, local um, uh, volunteers from Wild Oxfordshire and also confronting with the local water company, uh, he, he began to use this data to change the way or influence the way uh, wastewater was treated in the catchment. And it's an ongoing project. Uh, another small project is in Mauritius, where the Central Water Authority, with the Biological Association, started working with scouts who went out to were trained and went out to to make measurements throughout the uh, surface water bodies in the Mocha district, where they have a problem with eutrophication, and then eventually starting to work with farmers to try to figure out ways to reduce uh, the impact of their activities on the local water quality. Another example of a not so small but getting larger uh, project is that of uh, our colleagues from, from Brazil. We have several projects in Brazil. Um, this one was focused on a reservoir. As you might know, Brazil goes through periods of drought where the reservoirs kind of get very low and then there's very often a sound bacteria bloom, which causes problems obviously with the use of the water in those wetlands. The people around this particular reservoir, which feeds Sao Carlos, uh, with its fresh water, started to making measurements to identify where the hotspots were, where were the inlets that were starting to cause problems. And this is an ongoing project. Uh, getting larger, moving out over to China, um, the South China Agricultural University used citizen scientists, used the freshwater method to make to monitor um, along reservoirs and rivers that supply water to uh, Guangzhou. The, changing and modifying agricultural practices, they need some way to test on a larger scale uh, the impact of these change practices on water quality. So citizen scientists were making measurements throughout this area, throughout these, um, these reservoirs, these rivers, these lakes to see how things changed. And in fact, um, demonstrated that change agricultural projects uh, could improve water getting to a very large lake at this point. So we're also working on the east northeastern shore, the Tanzanian shore with communities um, to monitor water quality using the Freshwater Watch approach. And, uh, and this is an ongoing project with some very interesting results. Well, the in most interesting result I thought that I would present to you is um, that looking at the data and making the analysis, we, we noticed that, or they noticed that um, turbidity coincided, high turbidity concentrations coincided with elevated E. coli and coliform concentrations. So therefore using a $2 uh, Seiki probe, citizen scientists could monitor the waters that they use daily. And when the, constant, when the turbidity started to increase, there was, a, an under, there was a clear understanding that there was a higher probability of getting uh, coliforms and other pathogens in the water that they were daily using. So again, an example of a project that started through a, um, a larger project focused on Lake Tanzania, uh, Lake Tanganyika, but resulted in enforcing and empowering um, local, local communities through citizen science. Uh, 
another project that um, that briefly showed you guys is the uh, the paired in European blitz. So we've been running blitzes in uh, across the UK and Europe for. Uh, five or six years now. Most recently, there was a pan-European blitz, so all on the same weekend, thousands of people from London, Paris, Luxembourg, and Dublin made measurements um, at the same time, all throughout particular catchments, so getting hundred, getting thousands of measurements. They could then be compared and modeled and um, together with uh, local environment agencies and uh, local scientists with whom we work. Um, to understand where the pollution hotspots were. So this was a really good example of how citizen science can engage thousands of people in a very specific problem in a very specific location, getting information that no uh, research or agency could possibly acquire. Um, finally, uh, a word about where we're going with Freshwater Watch. So Freshwater Watch is expanding um, geographically. We have now a lot of projects in Africa, a lot of projects uh, again, in South America. Uh, we're focusing in several sectors. One, in trying to support, um, in Europe, trying to support the Water Framework Directive, and in particular, help farmers reduce their impact. Uh, so working with uh, farmer associations and the like to try to uh, improve the water bodies, the water quality of water bodies in Europe. In Africa, for example, we're working with the water, World Water Quality Alliance, as well as with uh, GEMS Water to try to see if citizen science and citizen scientists can acquire data that can be used together with the limited agency, agency data that's available to report sustainable development um, indicators, in particular indicator 632. This is an ongoing project in two different countries in, in, uh, in Africa and, and, quite, and quite interesting. We're doing a lot of research through the horizon. In Europe, we have a horizon um, funding uh, from the European community and trying to combine different data streams. So satellite data, drone data, um, optical to opt optical uh, instrument data with citizen science data to see if we can find information and combine this information to help both citizens, communities and agencies understand what's happening with uh, their local water bodies. So that's it. Um, I hope this was interesting and not too long. Um, Good luck for the rest of the conference. And thank you for your attention. Um, because uh, J John's not here, sorry, uh, yeah, John Lasuel's not here, then could you add any questions into the chat for him that we'll send on to him? And if you'd like to see the other video that made, the, made up the set here, his colleague Izzy Bishop was talking this afternoon about the how they were managing the data for the, this project and how they were how they were uh, testing for accuracy and proving uh, that the data was up to the standards required for reporting against the SDGs and that was really interesting. So that that recording will be on the. Um, the water workshop that we ran this afternoon, if you look at that in the resources. But if anybody's interested in that, just drop your name in the chat and I'll make sure you get a link anyway. And I'm sorry, I should have said earlier that um, if anybody has questions for Penn, he has another speaking in engagement in, in a little while. So he's only here for a short time. So if anybody has questions they'd like to put to Penn directly, could you do that um, now? Yeah, or, um, or you can just send it to me in chat. Uh, I'm also happy to just post my email in the chat if people like to you know, email you, me separately. Okay, it's just that you're here. So if anyone yeah, wants yeah. to talk to you directly. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or criticisms. Uh, I'm happily here Okay. Well. well, in that case, we'll, um, if nobody's putting their hand up, then we'll move on to the next presentation and hope we can... Uh, Get that to happen. Uh, so, no, oh. right. Good morning. No, this is the one I was looking for. This is Smriti uh, Sophia, and she lives in Hong Kong and. Uh, 
She's a PhD student doing interdisciplinary research. Um, she's also a board member of the Royal Geographical Society in Hong Kong and a member of SITSAI Asia, who we know well from the work that we do. And uh, her work's about researching citizen science in schools. Um, and she's got a lot to talk to us about um, on that. So Smriti, would you like to take the screen? Sure. Is that coming through okay? That looks very good. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Libby. And thank you, AXA, for inviting Citizen Science Asia to share a little bit about some new citizen science research coming out of Hong Kong. I'm Smriti. I'm the education director and the Hong Kong ambassador at Citizen Science Asia. CSA is a registered charitable organization in Hong Kong as of this year, finally after I think months of trying to make this happen or even years, and is also an official member of the GCSP. And its main goal is to support citizen science projects in the continent to address local and regional questions and challenges. And one such initiative to fill the knowledge gap about Hong Kong biodiversity is the Hong Kong Jellyfish Project, and we have the founder here, John Taranzini, to tell us more. Thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, so the Hong Kong Jellyfish Project is a citizen science project studying the presence of abundant distribution of jellyfish in Hong Kong, and uh, citizen science is a perfect methodology for it. We know that it's perfect for geographical or really large-scale projects, and Citizen science is not new in Asia. However, uh, Asian-focused citizen science is underrepresented in the literature, and nobody has studied Hong Kong's jellyfish before. So overlooked and understudied by scientists, uh, the jellyfish are frequently feared by the public for their stings, but they're quite important. They are a major predator with their trailing tentacles acting like troll net and catching whatever they, whatever they touch. And uh, they're also a major prey species. Everybody considers jellyfish food for turtles. However, 167 species of fish also eat them. So this project has looked at the seasonality of some of the jellyfish species that, are, that have passed through Hong Kong waters. Also the commonality of some of those species that are here and has been able to uncover three species records as well. These two species, are locally blooming populations. So future direction would be to examine where the polyps can be found and uh, look for where these blooming species are coming from. This uh, was based on a, one of the most successful marine citizen science projects known, uh, Ocho Alla Medusa by an Italian professor in the Mediterranean. And the Hong Kong Jellyfish Project uses a species poster or website and an iNaturalist project. To, as well as social media to gather as many sightings as, uh, as we can about jellies here. We're also in collaborating with uh, local researchers about genetics. So initial outreach was made towards swim clubs, sailing clubs, dive shops, paddle groups, basically anybody who might be near the water. Then ongoing presentations like this one are going out to those clubs. Uh, upcoming will be the Royal Geographical Society of Hong Kong and the Natural History Society as well. Got volunteers coming out have been school students, we have families coming out, adults coming out as well. Out of all the observations, uh, fully two-thirds of, uh, of the observers submit a single observation. However, we do have some stellar observers, one submitting over 20 observations herself. So Hong Kong is 93% Chinese, and uh, to avoid doing expat-only outreach, to get out of that bubble, all of the outreach is bilingual. So the poster, the website, initial outreach, uh, communications emails are in are bilingual. However, uh, subsequent communications in English, I can't read uh, and write Chinese. And this has paid large dividends because you can see 22% of website contacts use Chinese as the initial uh, language. So we, uh, we reaped huge rewards from that. 33% of the submissions did not know the species. So there's a great hunger for, uh, for more information about jellies here in Hong Kong. You can uh, look up 
information about the project here at the links that are on your screen now. Thanks so much, Cersei. Back to you. Thank you so much, John, for that whistle stop tour of your project. I now want to share some findings from research about the youth appetite for environmental action with citizen science as a catalyst, which is the topic of my PhD research. So I've been teaching geography and world issues in Hong Kong international schools for 13 years. And I've taken more than 2000 students on over 50 field trips locally and globally, because I think learning through experiential education is the best way. And it's not just me who says this, it's also the students. Here these photos show some examples of my students working in projects, citizen science projects, many of them, about terrestrial or marine issues. And most of the students in these photos have gone on to either study or work in the environmental field. So I know that there is an impact, but what I really want to know is can I measure it a little bit more clearly? So my research is using a quasi-experimental research design with citizen science at the core. And over a period of about two and a half months per school, there are pre and post surveys and interviews with students. And I also interviewed teachers and citizen science project organizers. I did this during the last school year. So there were a number of COVID related school closures, but I still managed to get this much data, which my supervisors assure me is enough to earn a PhD. So for those of you who are spatially minded, this is a map of Hong Kong showing the locations of the eight schools that participated in my research. And in the key, you can see that they were predominantly looking at biodiversity and or pollution issues around Hong Kong. So the good news is from some initial preliminary findings is that even a short amount of time participating in a science, citizen science project has a positive impact on the frequency and the range of pro-environmental behaviors, as well as the knowledge about environmental issues. And this is for secondary school age students in local and international schools. And in my conversations with them about the kinds of psychological factors that help them, that influence them on taking some form of action and help them come up with what they want to do, I found that there were some differences between ages and whether or not they were at local or international schools. So in this chart that I summarized these ideas, the local school students, the younger ones in particular, felt that they needed more knowledge and prior experience, whereas the international school students really wanted to know that will whatever action I decided to take have a tangible impact. Knowing that really influences them to take further action. But this all changes. The older students, and it didn't matter whether it's coming from local or international schools, they all felt that it all came down to things that were much more intrinsic. So what were their values and attitudes and where were their motivations? And those are the dominant factors that influence them to take some form of environmental action. So after doing citizen science projects, there were stronger correlations between the values to preserve nature and the kinds of actions that they would take, and also an increased correlation between the intentionality of taking action and the actions that students would take. And coming back to that knowledge part, about global questions, the students scored about the same. But interestingly, when it came to questions about local Hong Kong environmental information, the local school students scored twice as well as their international school counterparts. So I started to wonder, does it have something to do with how long someone has been here and just passively learning about the issues? So I looked at the residency times for these students, and it's about the same across local and international schools. So then it made me think that it's much more about what is being explicitly taught in the curriculum. And this means that international school educators have an opportunity here to be much more explicit about using local knowledge and local examples to make it much more relevant to the students' lives. Other things that educators can do to really enhance how students experience citizen science projects, the biggest thing is to really embed the project within the curriculum in ways that are much more authentic and that students can see value to. Ideally, let them choose what kinds of projects and the kind of involvement and the depth of that involvement. 
But a key part is also to make sure the students know exactly how their actions are contributing to the project. The teachers should ideally be regularly communicating and being that bridge between the project organizers and their students, especially when it comes to progress and impact. And then ultimately, because it doesn't end just with having submitted data to the project, like Penn had said earlier on, there's a bit more of an activism component to it. The teacher should really be able to demonstrate and discuss the kinds of follow-up action as a result of those citizen science project findings. So I still have more data to analyze, I'm not done yet. And so I'm looking more at the interview data as well as doing some structural equation modeling for understanding more about the variables in this environmental behavior framework that I've adapted to suit the Hong Kong education context. So practical outputs other than my PhD are to create resources for educators to incorporate citizen science more into their teaching and learning, especially for the context here, but also to create a space that acts as a bridge between experts and youth and educators and the public to initiate citizen science projects that address local and global community needs. And I'll be doing that with the help of Citizen Science Asia. So I just want to say a big thank you to my supervisors at the University of York and SEI and the foundations in Hong Kong that have supported my work. I've included my contact details here if anybody wants to chat about anything citizen science and education related. So thank you very much for listening to what's happening in Hong Kong. Back to you, Libby. Thank you very much, Smriti. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, I've got questions, but uh, some other people have asked questions as well. Would you like to ask them directly to Smriti? I'm interested in the fact that SITSI Asia is, is actually helping to, um, to try and put something together as a co-creation space. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, we're thinking of starting a little small, just to, in, a, in a way a bit of a, a trial pilot project to see, especially for the co-creation aspect, because I know that as a teacher, when my students have asked me questions and I did not know the answers and I wanted to seek out who might, especially if it was doing some kind of research project, I would have to start digging into and just Google searching to find experts. And I felt like if we had some kind of platform that was known across the education spectrum here to say, okay, if we were interested in a particular topic, we could go on to this very um, easy to access and easy to use database that would then show us, okay, here are some people who are interested in working with schools and students and teachers, because I know time is always an issue for a lot of experts. And so those who identify that they want to engage in a public way, but then also to even have NGOs who are always wanting to connect with schools, at least in Hong Kong, there's always some kind of youth ambassador of NGOs because they want to tap into the, the students' um, just energy and, and need for, for action. So I feel like that platform was missing. So we are currently reaching out, well, for funding as well, but also to the different groups of people and di uh, different stakeholders to say, A, would you be interested? And then B, would you like to sign on? And, and in what shape or form? So I think it'll still take a few months and I hope at some point to be able to, with Citizen Science Asia and the, the rest of the leadership team, launch it properly. No, that sounds fascinating and all good riches with that. Um, yes. Yeah. Now, um, i am just got to thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker if she's arrived. Um, I'm afraid Janine from Pr Pretoria was having some issues getting to join us. I don't know whether she's managed to, to join the meeting yet. Hi, yes. Hi, Libby. Oh, thank goodness. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. Hi. I managed to get code. Lovely. I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased about that. That that's excellent. Okay. Right. Um, in that Lovely. case, um, I'll I'll put the screen up for Janine. I said I would work her, her slides for her. So, um, um, this is Janine um, Witchman from Pretoria, and uh, we'll get to her presentation in just a tick.
I'm very pleased to see you, Janine. I was was worried you. Yeah, might... nice, nice seeing you online. And apologies, I'm actually in Cape Town, and I'm oh, at sorry. a at a restaurant, and it's a bit noisy. So <laughs> apologies <laughs> for the background noise. Okay, well, good of you to to spare time to be with us. Um, Lovely. And Janine's a, a, an assistant professor at the School of Health Systems and Public Health at the University of Pretoria. But um, as an environmental epidemiologist, and has, she has a primary interest in air pollution exposure assessment and health effects, um, and the, focused on climate change health effects and short-term heat effects on mortality and morbidity. So she's going to talk to us about citizen science in South Africa on that topic. So, uh, Janine, over to you. Just uh, tell me when you'd like me to move on. Thanks, Libby. Yeah, so um, the talk title of my talk is Citizen Science in South Africa, Ideas for Air Pollution Sampling. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, an article that was actually published earlier this year, and it's an excellent overview of uh, the, the state of citizen science in, in South Africa. So I would really recommend, if you're not aware about the, the citizen science in South Africa, to go and read um, this article. And it basically just summarized that most of the citizen science is being done um, on biodiversity or ecological studies, um, none in air pollution or water pollution or health for, for that matter. And it's also still a top-down approach, so it's not really the citizens um, who, who has an issue and then they get involved in the project. And most of the, um, the results are mostly communicated just among scientists and not really towards um, back to the community. So um, I think there's actually ample room to get more involved in citizen science in, in South Africa, especially on the air pollution and the climate change uh, side. Next slide, please. So why worry about air pollution sampling? In 2014, the World Health Organization identified air pollution as the world's worst air pollution uh, or environmental health risk. And it's estimated that one in eight people um, who die are actually dying due to air pollution exposure. And the sustainable development goals also cover air pollution and the associated health effects. Next slide, please. Uh, this is also a great um, article that was published in 2019. And um, Libby is actually one of the, the authors on, on this paper. And it draws in how citizen science can actually be um, uh, applied also to reach um, the sustainable development goals. And the article also mentions data quality issues and, and all those kind of things. And it, it's also very relevant to my kind of studies um, that one is doing on air pollution uh, sampling, how to monitor and track and in, in, ensure that you will get uh, good air pollution uh, data if you involve citizen science. Next slide, please. Um, however, uh, the true burden of air pollution may be underestimated in, in Africa due to the lack of, of good quality air pollution data. Um, so I just mentioned if citizens are gonna be involved in, in projects collecting data, um, there may be data quality issues and those kind of things, but already there are too few monitoring stations on the continent that is monitored at or controlled by people with expertise to start with. And this is also a good article to, to get a background on and it was published in 2018. Next slide, please. Uh, I apologize, this graph is very faint. It's coming from the journal article, um, but you can probably see all the dots um, in North America and Europe and in Asia and also around the border of Australia. All those dots are where air pollution monitoring stations are. Um, and most of the dots are actually green. So um, at the time when this article was published, the green dots indicated that the annual mean level of PM2.5, PM2.5 is tiny particles in the air, smaller than your, air, your red blood cells that you inhale deeply into your lungs where they can actually cause damage 
and contribute to death and morbidity. So those green dots indicate that in 2018, those places were still considered safe in regards to air pollution because um, the levels were below the WHO yearly guideline. And it, along the coast of Australia, it's actually very clean air pollution, as, uh, clean air quality as well. And you can see if you come to Africa, there are very few dots in Africa. So very few air pollution monitoring stations uh, that are actually in place in Africa to get an idea of what is the situation in Africa. So that's why I say um, it may be an underestimate of what the air pollution um, situation is really in, in Africa based just based on these few um, monitoring stations. Next slide, please, Libby. And to make matters worse, uh, this slide indicates um, countries that have air pollution or air quality standards that are enforced by law. And you can see most of uh, Europe, Asia, uh, the rest of the world have uh, air quality standards and air quality laws. And a vast majority of the African countries still don't have uh, air pollution and air quality standards and laws that are enforced. And this may actually explain then why there are not many uh, air pollution monitoring stations governed by citizens or the government bodies themselves. And this is coming from um, the UN um, uh, report that came out in 2020. Next slide, please. So this is just a graph of a fifth year medical student who helped, started helping me out in my air pollution sampling um, last year. This is taken on the roof of our building in Pretoria and you can actually see the, the thick air pollution layer, especially during winter time um, because of temperature inversions uh, that's happening in Pretoria and those, that area um, because it's a dry winters, not a lot of wind, and then you start seeing the air pollution accumulating. Once it's springtime, the wind comes in, the rain starts, and then the air pollution situation is much better. So, um, Tammy, the, the student who helped me out, she's holding, you can see here in the corner as well, a Jill Air pump. It's very light. It's like uh, probably a, a kilogram um, in weight um, that you can use for to collect PM 2.5 um, on a filter. I mentioned the PM 2.5 that you can nail deeply into your lungs. But unfortunately, the pump, you need um, a, a electricity supply, and that is not always possible in Africa. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, this is just um, an indication of, it's also quite demanding to weigh the filters. Um, and you need a very controlled weighing environment to weigh the filters. And our, our micro balance that you can see here in the, in the photo, I mean, that's also quite expensive. Um, so I would prefer to use low, low cost sensors um, if I uh, will be involved in, in citizen science uh, research. Next slide, please, Libby. So the idea is to use low cost sensors, um, but this article also came out in the Clean Air Journal. It's a South African based um, journal, um, but that also highlights that yes, one can use low cost sensors in citizen science or in, in, in science in general, but they need to be validated against um, the gold standards or the more um, uh, better instruments as well. I started having discussions with a, a colleague at the engineering department at the University of Pretoria, and um, we can actually build low cost sensors because if you, if you um, go to YouTube, there are numerous examples of low cost sensor air pollution sample uh, sensors that one can actually build. But at the moment, I don't know even if you know that, there's a shortage of, of computer chips. So we can't even start with that because we can't get hold of, of all the little um, components that you need for, for the local sensors. So this is just an idea to, to get an idea of what can be done. Um, but of course, one will also need funding in order to, to build a lot of local sensors and to train people to get them on board as well. 
Next slide, please, Libby. So this is just an example on, again, on our roof, you can see the drying rack um, in the background where we hang our driller pumps, the small pump that I showed you. And then on the front um, of the, the photo, you can see our air quality instrument that is more sophisticated and that is on, on uh, real time online um, PM 2.5 monitoring. So then we compare, compare the data we get with our um, reasonably cheap uh, little pump that we use compared to the, the more uh, snazzy, expensive instruments in the, in the, in the um, front of the, the photo. Next slide, please. So this is just a graph that one of my um, MEC students, she graduated already, where we compared um, the blue line is the, the dual air pump and the red line is the more sophisticated instrument. And in general, the correlation is very good between uh, the two instruments. So this is something that one will also need to do if you start building your own sensors, you will have to start validating it against a more um, expensive instrument to see whether uh, the data quality is actually good and that you can uh, use your, your, um, your data for, for studies, not also to communicate back to the general population. Next slide, please, Libby. So I've, I haven't been yet involved in, in citizen science um, projects, but in a way um, I am involved in citizen science in a way because the, the students I recruited are still enrolled for their studies in a postgrad diploma. So they are not experts in their own field yet, they're still being trained. So in a way, one can, can say it's a bit like quasi-citizen science. Um, and they started monitoring in Oshikati in Namibia, and Mbaban in Swaziland, and Mosiru in Lesotho, also Zaizai in Mozambique, and in a couple of locations in South Africa as well. And they all use these small um, Jolie pumps that, that um, I showed you on, on the photo. Next slide, please, Libby. That's it, that's, that's my talk, thank you. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that was very interesting and it's, uh, it's great to see that where, you've, where you're coming from. Um, does anybody have questions um, for Janine? Uh, Michelle's uh, got a, made a few comments about um, mm -hmm. things in in Australia, and uh, um, we are in contact with some colleagues in uh, America who are developing low cost sensors for various things, and there are big projects in Europe. So, as you say, there, there are opportunities to um, to work with people who who can help in terms of lowering the cost to to do more but it's a really important piece of work to be done. And hopefully um, Citizen Science Africa will help you uh, spread the word and, and get more people to do it if you can get a little bit of funding to set it up. Yeah. Absolutely. And then I also started having a, a meeting with Mina as well to get involved in, in the African um, Citizen Science um, part. So I think we will have more meetings and and try to take this further and, uh, and apply for funding as well. And I think it's, it is, will be better if we can get more African countries in as well. When we do apply for funding, then if it's just coming from one, one side. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure that's right. And there are other people who've done projects like this outside of Africa who I'm sure would be very interested in collaborating with you. Exactly, exactly. So. Good luck with that. Thank you thank very much you. indeed. Thank you, thank you for giving us your time. Lovely, thanks for the opportunity. Okay, um, so that was Janine. Now I'm going to share the screen again for our last uh, presenter this evening. Um, and this, this lady is Mariana Varese, who um, I got to know through the um, 
community of practice we set up to look at the UNESCO Open Science recommendation. And she's doing amazing work in the Amazon. Uh, she works for the Wildlife Conservation Society. And um, I, what I'm going to do is to, to play a, a presentation that she made for me last year um, when I was presenting to, to EXA at Berlin. Um, I did ask her for um, a six to eight minute presentation for this conference particularly. And unfortunately she sent me a presentation that was 18 minutes long. And, I, and it's fascinating and it has a, a really a great amount of really interesting information about citizen science in in brazil in amazonia and uh, there's this talk in there about um uh, people who are making records uh, for themselves about uh, deforestation and forest fires and things like that and covid um that aren't dealt with in in the first project so what I'll say to you is that we will add it into the recording that goes up onto AXA and I would recommend it to everybody to have a look at it. But for now, I'll show you the presentation that she made about one of the projects that she's involved with, which is uh, hopefully uh, this will this will play and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hello. Today I will tell you about the citizen science for the Amazon network. I will first describe the network, our rationale and design, and then I will share our progress with some thoughts about points of contact between citizen science and open science. Our network creates and shares knowledge in an accessible, trustworthy and timely way, with the ultimate goal of informing management and policy decisions. We are now over 25 partners of different backgrounds and from seven countries, all working on Amazon freshwater systems from their own perspectives. Partners have their own area of influence and lead collaborations with over 100 citizen scientist groups. Citizen Science for the Amazon is a regional network of local networks. We focus on Amazon freshwater systems at scale and started with migratory fish because fish are sentinels of the basin's connectivity, are critical for rural and urban people's livelihoods, and connect people with the ecosystem. In this extremely diverse, large, and complex context, we needed to create a common thread that brings us all together. So we jointly defined a common question at the scale of the basin that is large, generally enough, enough to gather multiple stakeholders around it, but it is simple enough that enables weaving other questions at local scales, catering to individual interests. We build from the knowledge, capacities and experience from our partners, and together we design, test and adapt solutions catered to the Amazon context, constantly learning in the process. Since 2017, we have agreed on guiding principles, variables, data collection protocols, terms of use, credit, and protection of privacy, among other important elements of our craft. So from now on, I will share some of our progress together with questions, challenges, and ideas for discussion. And I will use our guiding principles to do this. Of the network guiding principles, I want to highlight first our commitment to scale. This is what brings us together. And I think this is also an important point of contact between citizen science and open science. This slide provides an example of data on fish observations we have been able to gather and aggregate so far. This is data on fish observations. It still does not entail any sorts of analysis on interpretation and it does not involve any sort of ecological knowledge about the working of the system. And as you can see, the data is blurred by sub basins of level four. And this is related to the second principle I want to share. We embrace a diversity of sources of knowledge. This may be a source of potential tension with the goal of reaching scale that I just explained. 
and the goals of open science, and in two ways. First, reaching scale requires homogenization, while community-based monitoring or community science generally involve multiple forms of knowledge. This diversity makes it difficult to agree on common criteria or parameters or methods required for aggregation. Also, it sometimes forces us to negotiate among conflicting views of the world. Also, authorship, intellectual property rights, and appropriate credit given to non-mainstream scientists continues to be a non-resolved challenge, although important progress has been made in recent years, and we need to continue working on that. The third principle I want to share is called situated openness. Community-based initiatives in fragile ecosystem and involving indigenous and traditional peoples like in the Amazon bring to the front the tension between open science, open access, and protecting the privacy and rights of participating scientists. We are constantly dealing with this and are exploring and testing solutions. For now, we have agreed on this scaled approach you can see on the screen to data access. However, protection of privacy uh, limits the possibility of crediting citizen, sci crediting citizen scientists and also the possibility for them to being a build a community among themselves. Right now, local NGOs are being the brokers in this process. Another issue is that um, community um, science and community-based monitoring is used many times to inform decisions and negotiate with government agencies or other uh, actors. And here the issue of legitimacy of the data gathered by um, citizen scientists, it's still a big challenge we need to address. So um, to finalize, I wanted to share a few thoughts. Citizen science can contribute a lot to the field of open science in terms of helping us think about ensuring equal and active participation of society in knowledge generation, sharing and use. Also in terms of managing diversity and avoiding the risk that openness may um, imply for trampling um, uh, local people's rights. Also, open science has a lot to contribute to citizen science in terms of facilitating aggregation of data and knowledge, securing equal real access to information and knowledge for citizens and communities, and providing legitimacy of citizen scientist data before government agencies and mainstream science. Thank you very much. Um. But I think you'll agree that that was a, a fascinating um, presentation of a really important project with over 100 uh, groups of citizen scientists who've been working on this for a, a long time in the Amazon basin. And Mar uh, Mariana is very happy to take um, questions if you'd like to write them in the chat or, or write them to, to me or whatever then uh, she'd be delighted to talk to you. And as I say, her other presentation, which is 18 minutes long, um, is, is going to be available for you to have a look at. So um, I, would, um, I would highly recommend it as, as being a, a fascinating half hour or no, 18 minutes that you can look at. So that tonight is um, the selection of citizen science projects that are that we've got for you. Um, I hope that you find it interesting. Um, and this is, I think, one of the joys of having the, the AXA conference is that it gives us an opportunity to see things that we might not be seeing in our day-to-day -day, uh, working lives. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed seeing a few things that are happening in other places around the world. I'm glad you enjoyed it and um, yes, it will be recorded, it will be um, set out for you on the AXA website.
Thank you to all my speakers. Thank you very much to all of you who've stayed up or got up early or, or whatever. Um, we really do appreciate that. And I'd like also to thank Lisa and John who've helped during the session. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be in touch.